Another edition of Patients on the News. Uh, this time, uh, it's of course different. Uh, we're uh, using Zoom technology, and we're doing a remote interview with Professor Michael Franz, uh, who is a professor at Bowdoin College. Uh, good evening, Professor Franz. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me on the the show. We're delighted. So. Uh, I want to tell the audience briefly and then ask about who you are, but then ask you to elaborate a little bit on your work. Uh, Professor Franz, you are, are you in the history department or the political science department? Well, I'm in the political science department, although we call ourselves government and legal studies. Okay. And uh, you are an expert, we are told, uh, on many things, including public opinion, polling, etc. That's right. Why don't you Why don't you just uh, describe for the audience uh, the areas of your scholarly interest? Sure, happy to do so. So my research is on uh, uh, American elections, uh, and I come at it from a couple different angles. I study the uh, campaign financing side of elections and the role of political advertising and its influence on voters. And I also study public opinion and the political behavior of voters around elections, namely the factors that influence why they vote for particular candidates and how that's changed over time. All right, well, why don't we, uh, we move to the present time. And one of the things you and I have had brief chat that I want to talk about, and I think the audience will be interested in your insights, is we are in a period of extreme partisanship in the United States. Uh, I've been around a very long time. I've been in and out of government, and uh, clearly for most of my life, this wasn't the case, this extreme partisanship. And I don't know whether it's the result of <clears throat> political, more sophisticated political advertising, uh, more ways, internet, et cetera, to influence political thought. But uh, it's different now. And do you have any insight on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think we, well, first, we, we are deeply polarized in our politics uh, today um, in, in ways that we really haven't been in a very, very long time. Um, and um, one of the things that's, I think, deeply fascinating about our current political polarization, and, and we can talk a little bit about how we got here, but one of the things I think that's really fascinating about our current political situation is that our polarization is probably best understood as being a little bit more what we might call affective or emotional than, um, than it is uh, specifically about public policies. Now, policies matter a lot to Americans, and we have real debates about those things. But in today's American political environment, people really actively dislike members of the other party. And, uh, and that's uh, become uh, risen to levels that we really haven't seen in the history of public opinion polling. I mean, it's a deep, deep dislike that goes beyond just disagreements about policies, but is about, you know, the sort of what we would characterize as a sort of morality or the right and wrongs of those on the other side of the aisle. What, what, what brings us to that? I mean, political debate has been part of the human uh, condition forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly in this country, uh, we've had fierce debates. We've had uh, fierce debates going back to the founding of our country. Uh, but people get along and they work together and so forth. What, what I'm, I'm, uh, I happen to be a Democrat. Why would Republicans dislike me? I'm not, uh, uh, you know, trying to do anybody any harm. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's this, this, how we got here is a long story. And it's, it's, or it's, it's at least a, a story that has taken shape over many different, um, uh, many different dimensions and over many decades. But what we have today that feeds into our current polarization is, um, uh, you know, for one, um, a, a, a range of partisan media outlets that stoke these kind of affective disagreements. And so a lot of people put the blame on our current polarization on, on partisan media, uh, but I think we can sort of understand partisan media as uh, first a consequence of a lot of the trends that preceded it, that got us to the point where something like Fox News became something that could be started and could become popular. But then since you know, a, a Fox News was say created um, and talk radio in the 1980s, uh, that has had a, you know, a sort of additive effect on the affective polarization that we, we see today. So um, in our current political environment, we come to dislike the other side because the messages we hear from political leaders and uh, media elites uh, uh, casts our political debates in these moral terms. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have in today's uh, society when we're talking about policies or when we're talking about political uh, struggles, um, the other side is viewed as, as you know, um, downright in evil in some cases, as, as something that needs to be stopped, not something that we need to win the next election, but something we need to stop. We need to sort of defeat them because they're really undermining the American spirit. And, uh, and that does come from, in a more direct way, the way in which uh, media elites uh, in partisan outlets talk about politics. But them themselves, and we can go before, you know, go back in time even before them, are, uh, they are not the primary cause of it. They're largely a consequence of these long decades of drifting towards polarization. Um, and I, I sort of think that, uh, that all of this really started in, um, in, the civil rights, in the civil rights era of the 1960s, that when you go back into the 1950s, there were plenty of, as you know, plenty of liberal Republicans in the Northeast and plenty of conservative Southern Democrats. And the, the, the mix ideological mix in the parties uh, at the time kept the two parties, you know, distinct on some issues, but fairly moderated on uh, a collection of issues. But when the civil rights movement started a, a long reshifting where uh, Democrats became the party of civil rights and Republicans became uh, first the party that opposed civil rights, but then became the party that um, uh, didn't want large expansive government attempts to redress racial concerns. Uh, and over time, the two parties drifted. And as that happened over a number of decades, other things latched on to that polarization such that in today's political environment, you know, every issue can be sorted as a left issue or a right issue. Um, you had uh, uh, the culture war issues of the 1990s, the religious debates that were happening with the Christian right in the 1980s. You have identity politics today. Uh, all of it has begun to stack up on one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. And it really started with this big debate around civil rights. So let, let me give you an e e example. Uh, I was reading something about Jerry Falwell, uh, the, uh, or his son. I don't, I don't know if the son has the same name. President of Liberty University. Yeah. From conservative uh, uh, preacher. Uh, Donald Trump is, you know, he's not a guy who goes to church, doesn't know much about religion, isn't interested in religion, uh, does things that uh, would have, in the old days, offended religious people. Uh, but now, of course, they love, they, they, the religious uh, leadership loves Donald Trump. And is that part of this partisanship? They just say, well, we're on the Republican side and we don't care what Donald Trump does. We don't care what he does with women, what he says, how he conducts himself, what his character is like. He's on our side. Is that it simply? Well, in many ways it is because I think what they, you know, what many on the, the, the uh, Christian conservative side would, would argue is that the most important thing to them is the issue of abortion and judges. And so they're willing to, to deal with uh, an individual that morally doesn't fit, say, their standards, 
um, but who is on the right side of that particular issue for them. And so they've made the political calculation that they will get the judges they need with Donald Trump, and they obviously won't with Hillary Clinton, and they certainly won't with Joe Biden, and they definitely didn't with Barack Obama. And so uh, when push comes to shove in that zero-sum game, Donald Trump's, Donald Trump's their, their candidate. And so they've been able, they've attempted to rationalize that. You know, I've heard all sorts of arguments uh, attempting to rationalize that. But ultimately, I think that it's a political calculation that comes down to the fact that if the Democrats are in charge, the judges they appoint, given the fact that we are at, you know, at this elite level polarized so much on these issues, the Democrats are going to nominate judges who are um, disposed to support the pro-choice side. And so um, it doesn't matter what kind of person Donald Trump is, that ma what matters more to them is, is in this particular case, the, the policy. And going back to something you mentioned uh, earlier about the difference in media now and the various sources of information, uh, when I was a younger person, person, of course, uh, on television, uh, we just had three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Everybody in the country, no matter what their political opinions, got their news from the same source. So uh, we could disagree on our reaction to the news, but it was from the same source, and we had to rely on it. Do you think that now everybody gets to choose whatever source they want? Uh, including simply propaganda, whether it's one side or the other, Democrat or Republican, there are many people that say, you know, I only want to listen to the Democrat propaganda, or I only want to listen to the Republican propaganda. Do you comment on that? Absolutely. I, I actually think there's two two primary reactions to that. The first is is exactly what you said in the sense that, you know, back 50 or so years ago when there were, were many fewer media outlets, there was also simultaneously trust in those media outlets. So even Republicans had, you know, respect for um, the major news networks and the major papers of record, even if they, you know, didn't always agree with, with the way, you know, politics was covered. And Americans themselves had deep, dis deep trust in those media sources. And so everyone across the political spectrum would get the same news, if you will. Uh, and one of the things I find fascinating to, to think about is that in those days, people were fascinated with television as a as a technology and most people would turn the tv on and, and many people would leave it on and watch during dinner and so scores of americans who otherwise were not necessarily interested in politics learned about the vietnam war learned about the civil rights movement learned about the economic challenges of the 1970s and were informed about politics by virtue of that sort of single broadcasted stream of information and that was true across the political spectrum and as the media developed into more partisan options, including today's internet age, where you can get any range of political, uh, political views, very narrow slice to a wider slice on any internet page you, you want, um, people self-select into the media that reinforces the views that they, they have. And that allows people to be in these, what are oftentimes called the echo chambers, where they hear only from the political perspective that they prefer. The second point I'll make is that um, parallel to all of that is that there are large percentages of Americans, or at least a, 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 you know, an importantly large percentage of Americans, who actually don't like politics all that much, who aren't interested in politics. They vote maybe and they participate when they feel like they need to, but ultimately they're not really interested in politics, deeply interested like you know, many of us. Um, and what happened when the media changed in the 1980s into the 1990s with the development of cable and many entertainment options was people went from watching Walter Cronkite and hearing about Vietnam to opting into ESPN or to HBO or towards other, you know, the cooking network or uh, shopping network. And they opted out of politics entirely because they didn't really, they weren't really interested in it. So in the past, it was the only thing on at 630 or whatever. And so they watched it because they were you know, that's what it was. TV was kind of an interesting uh, technological thing. But now they could watch whatever they wanted. And so they would watch movies or they'd watch sports. And so a large percentage of Americans have opted out of politics and into entertainment. And that has made them less informed. And it has left the pool of people who are interested in politics opting into the partisan outlets. 
And so we have this sort of simultaneous story of some leaving politics and some moving deeper into their partisan camps. And, and that I think is a sort of long, again, a long trend, but a deeply fascinating one that brings us in part to where we are today. Let's talk about facts for a minute. Uh, just the notion of what's a fact and what isn't a fact. I'm a lawyer, I've been a lawyer for a long time. And of course, uh, our justice system depends on uh, ferreting out facts. And uh, so I, I like facts and evidence. And uh, put somebody on the stand and say, did you say this? And they say, yes, I said it. And they have, I put somebody else on and they corroborate it. That's tending to prove the fact. Now, I think a lot, for a lot of people, facts don't mean anything. I mean, we have a president who tweets constantly. Those are his words. He tweets something or he goes on television and he says something, and now we have video recordings of everything. We have recordings of voice and his lips moving. And, uh, and then a week later he says, I didn't say it. And people believe that. Mm -hmm. He said it. There's video of him saying it. Same with Democratic politicians, same thing. But there's video of Trump saying it. And then he says, I didn't say it. Fine with a lot of people. They say, okay, he didn't say it. What makes human beings able to pull that off? Well, you know, so I think there's, in, in many ways, yeah, I mean, it's, it's stunning uh, that the, the environment we're in in that, in that way. And I think there are um, maybe two, two tiers to that. So the, the first tier is, is not the really bad one that you just mentioned, which is where people sort of decide not to believe something that can actually be be proven completely wrong, right? right? But it's it's where people bring to the debate the evidence that they need to make their point. And so, wh wh and what I mean by that is where there is a contestation over what's actually true. And I think the ugly secret of, of our world today is that, you know, evidence and facts are deeply important, but very rarely are complex things either or. And so in our political world, let's just use this current crisis, for example, um, we could very, you could very straightforwardly say, here's the facts, here's the evidence of Donald Trump's um, delayed reaction to the coronavirus issue. You know, what did he do in February? Here are the, here are the things he said on TV about, you know, um, it's not that big of a deal. It's, we're gonna take care of it quickly. But then you might say, well, you know, the other side might say, well, but eventually he got around to it and it's actually the WHO's problem and Democratic governors have messed it up in their states. And in a way, you might sort of be able to build a story where some facts support that particular case. And then what you do is you fight that fight with your facts and the other side fights with their facts, what Kellyanne Conway called alternative facts. But in reality, everyone's using correct quote unquote information to make their case and nobody's seeing the complexities, right? And so that's a situation where you actually have, I don't wanna call it post-truth or post-modern, but where you actually have people sort of selectively using true information to reinforce the position that they want. And, and that's a deep, deeply problematic issue today, especially when, when politics are complex. But the second layer is the one you mentioned, which is where people just refuse to believe clear evidence. They, they, they see President Trump saying something or they see a Democratic politician saying something and then when they contradict themselves, you know, we just dismiss that. And I think a lot of that comes down to, again, believe it or not, it just comes down to that deep dislike of the other side. Most of us are making that zero-sum proposition. If Donald Trump is, is a liar, then I have to maybe not vote for him because that would, what would that say about me? And so, well, I'm going to actually stack him up against Hillary Clinton and say, well, I don't like either of them, but she's worse. And so they kind of rationalize the, the choice that they have to, to make the other side worse. And, and that's how they kind of get around that tricky situation of, of not wanting to believe evidence that's clearly in front of them. They also think, I've talked to, to people who are Trump supporters, and of course they focus on what the press does. The press is doing all of this. 
uh, to Donald Trump. He has these people in the press that are just after him. Well, of course, I was a deputy White House press secretary, and I happen to know every president has the press after him. And particularly presidents, if a president brags a lot or says something that's not true, that's just like waving a red flag in front of the press. They just get on it. They love to try to poke holes in things. But every president's had the same problem. But these folks think that when Trump gets criticized by the press, it's a bias. It has nothing to do with anything he says or any way that he, he, he acts. And I guess that's just part of what you're talking about. You know, these people seize on a position. This is the position I have and, uh, and nothing else matters. Well, that's true. And, and you know, and in, there are examples, you know, true, that, or there are examples and have been over the years that give folks who want to make those claims some ammunition. You know, I mean, the New York Times has made mistakes or they've reported some, uh, they've reported things that haven't been fully sourced sometimes. And so they have made mistakes. They have, um, uh, uh, as every media outlet does. And so that gives Republicans in this case, or it might give Democrats in the other, in, in, in another case, the opportunity to, um, to use those as examples for why we shouldn't trust those outlets. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and so that, that raises the stakes these days for every journalist to make sure that, and, you know, the good journalists are doing this all the time, but to make sure that they've fully sourced everything, that they've got as many people as they can on the record, that they anticipate that, in fact, they're going to get blowback um, if the story is, an, is critical of a, of a particular candidate. Um, but yeah, people, people have been told by partisan uh, media outlets and by political leaders for many years that the media is biased and that it's out to, to bring um, their side down. And when you do have the occasional, um, you know, the occasional evidence to suggest that journalists have been sloppy, that just feeds into that narrative. And I'm thinking also of the big controversy in 2004 around Dan Rather and um, the reporting on, on uh, George W. Bush's service uh, uh, or exemption from service in Vietnam. And that proved to be a mistake in terms of the uh, information that Rather uh, reported, I think, on 48 Hours. And so, um, boom, bam, that's all you need as a hook in order to try to sink all major mainstream news outlets as being in the tank for the Democrats. All right, so don't we have something else uh, that counters that going on in our society now? In 2004, 16 years ago, we certainly had a lot of television and a lot of video. But I have a sense, just a sense, that today in the, in the current age, 2020, that we have more of reporting by video, by, by, by video record. That is that politicians or presidents may say something, it's recorded, and then three years later, four years later, five years later, when they say something else, it isn't uh, Dan Rather making a mistake, it's, a, it's the media putting a video on television with the president or the pol whoever the politician is speaking. His voice is coming over. He's saying something, mm -hmm. and that's all they do. They say, well, in 2010, he said X. Watch this. Right. What, is a, what does a partisan do with that? Right. Well, I mean, I'm thinking of, in, in particular, in, in the example you cite, I'm thinking of all of the videos that I watched in um, December and in January uh, of this, you know, this year and late last year of Democrats on the opposite side of the impeachment issue when Clinton was being impeached, some of the same Democrats who are in uh, Congress today and Republicans who are in Congress then, you know, saying the exact opposite about witnesses and so forth uh, and around the impeachment trial there. Um, absolutely. I mean, Mitch McConnell is on record many times over the years uh, saying the opposite of what he believes. My, my own research is on campaign finance and, and Senator McConnell was on record for many years as being, you know, against all campaign finance laws, but for um, a vigorous and strong disclosure regime of campaign financing. And now he's opposed to even that. 
Um, and so you have him on the one hand, you know, a video saying this, and in the other hand, a video from today saying the opposite. And again, I think, I think it's a lot, I mean, political psychologists talk about this as, you know, selective exposure and motivated reasoning, you know, where we just, we, we literally will just listen and rationalize however we can rationalize it in order to make our party um, right. And so in this particular case, you can imagine someone say, oh, well, that was yada, 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 and the circumstances are not exactly the same today. And, um, you know, and they might even go so far as to say, why can't a, a politician change his mind, for goodness sake, you know, and, and everything becomes rationalized through the partisan lens. Talk a minute, let's talk a minute about campaign finance. That's an area of expertise that you have. Um, why is it? I can never figure this out. You know, Democrats seem to favor campaign reform and, and restrictions on campaign finance and money in politics. And Republicans are opposed to it. They say they're not, but they are. And I don't care what they say. I, there's a body of evidence that shows that they're opposed to it. Why would that be? I mean, they're both involved in campaigns. They have the same issues. They have primaries where people might outraise them or whatever. Do you have any insight on that? Well, I mean, it, to some extent, you know, I think that uh, Democrats are on record as being in favor of certain campaign finance reforms, um, uh, some more vigorous uh, than others in partic for particular politicians or in particular times. But they are not opposed to exploiting all of the loopholes that they can in a given political situation if, you know, if the, the laws allow it. And so, you know, if Democrats could get their way, they would pass a series of reforms that would be more restrictions on the flow of money in politics today than um, uh, more than, they, you know, that exist today. But they're not opposed, just to, just to state this a different way, to um, using big money, big donors, holding huge fundraisers, starting and running super PACs, even though they're in principle opposed to those things. Uh, and so to some extent, whereas Democrats in principle want reform, but in practice uh, are happy to exploit the laws as they are today, Republicans um, uh, uh, you know, um, oppose, these, uh, oppose new restrictions uh, knowing that they can benefit from them politically. Um, but I think that one thing that divides the Democrats from the Republicans on this issue is, is what I've been fascinated about for years is the way in which the two parties will treat corporations and unions. And so for Democrats, obviously, the big problem is corporate money. And so a lot of their reforms want to limit the flow of corporate money and large um, uh, large wealthy individuals uh, and their resources probably accumulated through the corporate form over the years uh, into, into, into the political system. But Democrats don't like to treat unions as the liberal equivalent to corporations. In, in Democratic mindsets, unions represent people power. And so when after the 2016 election, when uh, there was real concern about digital advertising and um, the lack of disclosure around who was funding some online Facebook ads, Democrats came up with provisions even after the 2008 and 2012 election that tried to make more disclosure and limit corporate spending in elections, but they didn't necessarily want to put unions in the mix. They wanted to let unions use union dues for large expenditure campaigns because to Democrats, unions are people power. They're not you know, big money. Well, Republicans don't view it that way at all. Republicans have made the argument for years that unions are essentially the other side of the coin with big money. If, we, if we're gonna limit corporate influence, we have to limit union influence. And so that's an under, I think, appreciated distinction between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. It's a bit of a philosophical one, but it also <clears throat> lines up nicely for the Democrats, which is that if they can prevent corporate money into the system, but allow union money into the system, then Democrats would benefit from, from those laws. Um, but it also isn't, you know, pure politics because he, Democrats just view unions differently. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, I, I agree with what you just said, and that's a, a, an interesting issue because um, unions 
I've never been a, a great fan of unions, but I think they're absolutely critical in our society. Uh, you, unions are the only way that non-rich people, employers, employees, can organize to have any power. If I'm a capitalist and I own a big uh, paper company or mill, and I own it, and I do what I want, and uh, I want to endorse a candidate, and I spend, uh, I'm, I'm like Sheldon Adelson in uh, Nevada, I say, okay, I'm going to give $100 million of my money uh, for the Republicans to win the particular races. But a, a guy who's uh, showing up to work with a lunch bucket, he has no impact, zero. No one would pay attention to him whatsoever. He's not going to give him any money. If he gives him five bucks, it's nothing. So he organizes. And it's the reason why we have unions. It's an organized group of people who singularly have zero power. But mm -hmm. together, they have a lot of power. And so it's uneven. I don't compare mm -hmm. the union. I know the argument. You're right about the argument. Yep. But I don't compare uh, the problem with unions and a bunch of people having uh, $20 taken out of their paychecks to give to the union to make a do big donation to somebody who is enormously wealthy, controls a company, does whatever he or she wants. And so, but I understand uh, uh, the argument. It's interesting, uh, after Citizens United, of course, uh, the Congress did try to pass a law, and it was essentially because Republicans wouldn't vote for restrictions on amounts. It was a disclosure law. That's right. And 100%, every single member of the Republican caucus in the Senate voted against it because Mitch McConnell told them to, including our two, quote, moderate senators in Maine, mm -hmm. uh, Snow and Collins. They voted against that reform. So I've just always been intrigued why it's so important. And I think it comes from the top. The Republican donors generally, and this is, there's many exceptions to this, are uh, big money donors. Sheldon Adelson being uh, uh, a great example. The Koch brothers, a great example. And it's those people who want to keep their influence, who put the pressure on the Republican Party, I think, to uh, to oppose reform. Anyway, we we can talk. You anything else you want to comment about? Yeah, on, just on, just yeah. really quickly on that point. I mean, if no, you go we back, don't have to be quick. you don't have to be quick. Okay, sure, thanks. Uh, but uh, if you go back to even the debate around that that bill, the Disclose Act, after the 2010 Supreme Court case, um, Republicans' arguments were oftentimes that the Democratic bill was unfair because it didn't put the similar restrictions on, on unions. It treated unions in many ways differently than, than corporations and nonprofit corporations and so forth. And so um, in our partisan age, to kind of loop back to that, that partisanship that characterizes our politics today, even moderate Republicans like Snow and, and Collins come to view the democratic efforts here as sort of trying to sneakily undermine Republican uh, Republican ideological views. So I'm, a, you know, I might be a moderate Republican, but gosh, I cannot trust what Harry Reid or what Chuck Schumer are trying to do here. And I think there's something that they're trying to slip in uh, that um, that is going to damage the Republican Party. And so, even in principle, more disclosure sounds great, but there's there's a distrust of of the sort of democratic policymaking that goes on there. The second point I'll make is, is just not to forget that Barack Obama was in office for eight years. He was one of the first candidates to refuse to take public funding in the presidential public funding system. And he did almost nothing in eight years to prioritize campaign finance reform. Obviously, he stood up in front of the American people and chastised the court around the Citizens United decision. And he supported the Disclose Act but he put almost no political energy into those efforts, primarily because he also knew that um, uh, he had won in 2008 by vastly outspending John McCain and 
was a prolific fundraiser and could mobilize Democratic super PAC efforts to help his campaign in 2012. Um, and so um, even though Democrats in principle strongly support these things, when they see themselves as benefiting from the status quo, they won't put a lot of political energy into trying to change that. Oh, well, that's a good point. And that takes me back to something you, you, you said earlier that uh, the Democrats uh, in principle say they're against uh, unlimited spending, but they take advantage of it. But of course, that's practical politics too. Uh, they would be pretty stupid to say, okay, Susan Collins is going to spend $30 million in their Senate campaign this year, and the Democrat says, I'm a per person of principle, we're going to spend 500000 mm -hmm. because you're certain to lose. Because that's, that's taken, so political advertising matters, I trust you think. Well, you know, yes, that, and, and if, you know, it, it does matter, but I, I, I um, it matters, so, it matters wh where it's important, which is on those margins. And so absolutely, if, if Susan Collins spends $30 million and a Democratic opponent spends half that, those ads are going to matter because there's a huge out, you know, there's a huge imbalance there. Ads don't, you know, can't, can't make you a better candidate if you're a bad candidate. But, um, but definitely, if you can vastly outspend your opponent, you know, you're going to be in the driver's seat there. So Democrats have to play that practical political game and they know that. And so we all have to understand that. Um, but it ends up being frustrating for us. And I think does contribute to a cynicism that people have when they see, you know, a party like the Democrats standing up against big money, but participating in a big money system and then justifying it as, well, we have to play the game that's, you know, play by the rules that exist. I think people want, you know, some principle. Uh, and, and so I think that, that feeds sometimes into our cynicism when we don't see that play out. Yeah, I think about we have many of the progressive candidates, uh, so-called progressive, I don't even know what that means, but they call themselves progressive candidates, uh, actually do take a stand. Because I won't take corporate money, I won't take PAC money, uh, and so forth. But oftentimes they don't get very far politically. You know, they say it, but they, don't, but they lose. Well, one, one of the great examples of that is Russ Feingold from Wisconsin, who was uh, obviously one of the architects of uh, McCain-Feingold bill, which was passed in 2003, uh, 2002. And um, uh, uh, he uh, famously refused to, to um, he absolutely rejected any super PAC spending on his behalf in the 2010 election, um, uh, as he had done in previous elections, uh, but he lost. And so um, he barely won some elections in Wisconsin because he had been so vocally against outside groups coming in to spend on his behalf, kind of won by the skin of his teeth there for a few times and then eventually uh, lost. And so um, many candidates look around and think, I can't, uh, I can't risk that. You know, if I want to win, I'll, I'll fix it when I get there, but I got to get there first. And, you know, it's an old story. You, 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 uh, back to the union uh, campaign contribution limit issue. Uh, while you were talking, I was thinking, if I was Susan Collins, uh, who voted against the Disclose Act, allegedly for the reasons you outlined, uh, I would say to myself, well, I got 7,000 or 6,000 voters down at Bath Ironworks. They're all union members. They all contribute to the union. The union makes contributions. And so I got all of those voters down there, union members. And then, you know, I have other people. I have very wealthy Maine industrialists who control companies, who make co contributions, big, big contributions in their own name or in their, in some cases, uh, through their company pack or whatever. Uh, why wouldn't I, why would I do something to, uh, why, why did I say I'm not voting because this for, for the Disclose Act because this this doesn't limit the unions? I would be a little worried about that. Now, the union members would say, "But what about we will have no impact unless we're permitted to make these contributions." But that doesn't occur to anybody, and I don't think it occurs to the union members either. So well, and I I think because primarily, if you think about you know uh, to go back to the early conversation we were having, you know that presumption you know is based off of 
workers today, um, to the extent that we have, you know, manufacturing and other sort of sort of blue collar workers who um, otherwise would would mobilize around their economic their shared economic interests um, presumes that that is a primary driver of people's sort of political orientations. But in fact, because our politics has become polarized on everything, you can mobilize, you can kind of cut into that sort of economic discontent that many workers might feel in opposition to their employers or to wealthy, uh, wealthy industrialists or to a, an elite political class by appealing to other cultural issues that might peel off some of those, you know, preserve some of those votes. And so um, one of the things that Donald Trump did, did really, you know, was very successful in the Midwest, upper Midwestern states in 2016 was winning um, uh, uh, working class white votes, uh, which if, a, if you're a working class voter, you would presumably policy wise, economically, think that Hillary Clinton would, would, would you know, implement better policies for your economic situation than um, Donald Trump, who has a history and, and was highlighted history of, of, you know, oftentimes not even paying employees when he was, uh, you know, running the Trump, uh, Trump organization. Um, but in fact, Trump was able to emphasize, you know, nationalism, was able to emphasize a different set of political issues that appealed to many um, uh, working class white voters, namely concerns about, you know, quote unquote, the other, concerns about uh, diversification of the American citizenry, concerns about globalization, concerns about, uh, uh, you know, patriotism. And, and those things were able to cut into what would normally be, you know, a, a clear democratic talking point, which is vote for us because our policies are better for your, your wallet, right? But many voters were thinking more about, I'm thinking more about culture, I'm thinking more about my country, I'm thinking more about the direction of the country. And those things, Donald Trump was able to prioritize. Donald Trump, of course, didn't invent that. Uh, I remember I'm, you probably weren't even born in 1968, were you? Yeah. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, in 1968, because I was involved in that uh, campaign uh, nationally, and uh, George Wallace uh, did the same thing, and he really captured uh, the interest and support of working class people in the upper Midwest in Michigan and Minnesota and Ohio, uh, just as Donald Trump did. And since that time, since 1968, uh, those have no longer been uh, Democrat votes that Democrats could vote, could, could uh, count on. And let's just, I, I'll say it, I'll get it on the, on the agenda here, but when we say cultural, and the other and so forth, uh, it's race. I mean, the fact of the matter is, since human beings have been on this planet, they have lived in fear of somebody who's strange, who's different, who, who they're not familiar with. Uh, it, from cavemen, Neanderthals on, that fear has always been part of human nature. And politicians trade on it. And in, and it's a very effective thing to do. And I don't think Donald Trump is a racist, but I certainly think he knows how to send little signals to people who are racist. And I would say one other thing, and I want you to comment on this. Um, most human beings do not regard themselves as racist. I mean, there are a lot of people who say, you know, I like Trump. He says it like it is. He doesn't have any tolerance for Black Lives Matter or other movements like that that irritate people. Uh, so he says it like it is. He's not politically correct. There, I understand about political. There are things that are politically correct that drive me nuts. They drive me nuts. But the fact of the matter is what those people are talking about when they talk about he's not politically correct is he sends these signals. Mm -hmm. and. Race is exceedingly important in American politics. You agree with that or disagree with it? Oh, I think it's, it's, it's 
deeply, deeply important to understanding the American story. So, um, you know, we oftentimes think about American politics as, or at least American cultural history, political cultural history, as being about the, the debate between, or at least the sort of simultaneous synthesis, synthesizing of the sort of, you know, can-do individualism spirit of the sort of, um, uh, you know, Horatio Alger stories of lift yourself up by your bootstraps and cowboy with the sort of um, community, you know, um, a town hall meeting, uh, a collective civil energy that Tocqueville documented in his travels through America in the 19th century. And so we oftentimes have this debate about individualism versus civil society in America as, under, as sort of underscoring the sort of American story. But if you don't add to that race as a sort of primary debate in American politics and a debate that Americans have been having about who is a real American, um, which has been happening for 200 plus years. I mean, the whole 19th century was a, a debate about slavery and then post-slavery and racial integration. And then in the 20th century about civil rights. And now we're talking about identity politics in the 21st century as the country becomes more diverse. Um, you can't understand American history without understanding the way race racial distinctions um, and racial hierarchies have um, uh, frustrated our capacity to call ourselves a true democracy. Um, and so uh, I think that that's deeply important here. And I'll just say one thing, I'm not really, I'm not a scholar of racial politics, American racial politics uh, specifically. It doesn't factor into my own in any specific ways on research to the extent that it might show up in studies of campaign spending and, and obviously political behavior. but. I think one of the things that's really fascinating about our current political environment is most, of course, you're absolutely right. Most of Americans would, of course, uh, vehemently deny that they're racist or that they hold racist views. But I think what's oftentimes lost in this is a debate over what it means to be a racist. So in the, in the olden days, racism was about biological inferiority. You know, to say someone was not truly a sort of as human as someone who was from European background that was a traditional understanding of racism. Now, almost nobody would argue that today. Um, that's sort of been, not everybody, of course, but that has, has largely been sort of expunged from our sort of contemporary discussions about race and racial differences in America. And I think it's been replaced by what we might call sort of cultural distinctions. You know, you'll hear a lot of people who might say, well, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a racist, but certain groups of people just don't know how to do this or just don't work very hard. And they're not making a biological argument, they're making a cultural argument. And they're not making an argument that's based up, well, many people have challenges because of structural inequities or because society doesn't accept everybody. No, they're making a cultural argument about people's motivation to work hard or their devotion to family. And they're saying certain groups of people don't have those traits might not be a biological argument, it's a cultural argument, and they refuse to accept that that's racism. And I think that that's why many Americans say that they're not a racist, even though they might have very deeply held opinions about how groups of people on the basis of the color of their skin are or are not likely or less likely to be hard workers or to be devoted to their family or to hold certain moral positions. And, and so I think we should really be having a, a discussion in this country about what it what racism actually means, what it looks like and how we define it. Because I think there are a lot of people who hold <clears throat> race, racial views um, that um, uh, are not based off of very old traditional understandings of what racism is. Um, but when I talk to my students and when I try to understand and read about American history, I, I do uh, uh, very clearly point out that I think racism is critical to understanding race in general is critical to understanding how this American experiment has played out. The, you pointed out something important, I think, talking about in answering that question, uh, the diversity in America, and it's a changing face of America. I mean, people say uh, that uh, 30 years from now, there will be more people in this country whose skin color is closer to Barack Obama than whose skin color is close, closer to mine. And so there is change. And people do fear that, don't they? They sure do. They absolutely do. So, so um, 
the arc of history, there is an arc of history. And do you think that if you look ahead, uh, the arc of history is bending against those who want to preserve the status quo when it comes to race or nationalism or anything else that it's they're, it's they're swimming up river i think that's i think that's broadly true in the sense that you know for democrats for many years they have 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 understood that a long term game here is that they will benefit from increasing diversity in the american sort of composition um, that you know as more hispanics African Americans, Asian Americans, as it all diversifies, as the, the Democratic Party, um, as their tent includes more of voters of different backgrounds, as more and more people feel comfortable expressing sexual orientations uh, that they feel comfortable with, that they feel is, is, is naturally theirs. If they're the party that accepts everybody's based on their own terms, I think Democrats see that as the sort of long-term strategy to, to win against a, a Republican party that is increasingly reliant uh, on white voters and Christian white voters as their base. Um, uh, but the only thing I'll say that's a bit of a wrinkle to that sort of playing out perfectly for Democrats is that you know demo, demo, demographics are not destiny, that um, many voters who, uh, Hispanic voters or black voters may hold conservative issue positions and they may come to hold conservative issue positions where they might find some home in the Republican Party in years to come. But also the structure of American politics still in many ways will benefit or disproportionately benefit Republicans, especially with the US Senate in the way it's currently constructed. And so small states, well, Wyoming, Montana with small populations, they're not gonna get very diverse in the next 30 or 40 years. At least they're not gonna get as diverse as New York, California, Florida, other states, Texas, and they're still gonna keep those two Senate votes. And so Republicans, even as a party that's disproportionately reliant on white voters, may still be very competitive in Senate, Senate elections and in controlling the Senate for decades. Um, and if they're able to kind of hold on to power in the Senate, they can stop anything the Democrats want to propose. Um, and so uh, that will keep our national politics fairly competitive. That's very interesting observation. Uh, you know, we're getting close to the uh, end of our interview, but many of the things that we're talking about, of course, are not new in this country. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, we had a period uh, before and after the Civil War uh, the, the age of reform, and uh, and then we had uh, more reform with Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson, and then with Roosevelt. Uh, so reform has always been with us, and the resistance to reform, I think some historians have called it social Darwinism. Look, it's just the way it is. You're always going to have people that are on in equal, unequal positions because all human beings are born unequal. And so that's just the way it is. And we ought not to try to change something that can't be changed. Whereas the reformers, uh, those who are not social Darwinists, they say, look, as a community, we can come together as a community and look after each other a little bit. Society as a whole is important to all of us, whether we're powerful or not powerful, rich or poor. And that's, would you say that that is a debate that continues in America? Absolutely. I, 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 I think um, the, just to recharacterize it a little bit, I think what you'll oftentimes hear that in that first camp about the social Darwinists um, is instead sort of a, a, a repackaging of progressive views uh, or a reframing of progressive views as um, the desire to let everybody live a happy life regardless of whether they work hard. And so you'll oftentimes hear people talk about equality of outcomes. And so social Darwinists will say, well, that's the last thing we want is for you know, um, everybody to get $2,000 a month from the government or to be able to, to work a four day work week, uh, everybody to be guaranteed a minimum income. I mean, oh my gosh, you know, society progresses on winners and losers and competition and 
And so we can't possibly initiate some of these policies in order to, um, uh, in order to, you know, let people sit at home all day and so forth. And so there's, they reframed the debate to be about encouraging, you know, uh, uh, or at least rewarding the lack of initiative um, to discourage entrepreneurship. Uh, and that's how things get framed. Whereas the other side of the argument, I think, that, you know, in many cases, many people would, would love to give everyone a guaranteed income and, and have a four day work week and a 30 hour work week and so forth. Cause they want people to, you know, you know, not be, uh, uh, have their lives not determined by work. But I would say most mainstream conservatives are not about equality of outcomes at all. They're about equality of opportunities and they're about trying to redress um, historical inequities in access to resources and opportunities. And so the debate is less about outcomes and more about opportunity. And I think that's where people sometimes miss each other um, uh, because we want every American, I think every American should have the opportunity to participate in politics and to participate in economic life to the extent that they can um, and to not have structural inequities prevent them from doing so. But to the extent that policies try to implement that, they'll, that view might often get characterized as being sort of um, uh, anti-American in a way because it's uh, repackaged as a um, giving away free stuff kind of thing. What, what is an ex, uh, structural inequities, you use that term, uh, what are they? Money, financial situation, race, color of skin, are those, right. are those the kind of structural things you're talking about? I, I, you know, all of those things, but I think you can think of it as examples of, you know, like if you, across the across America, if you look at, you know, sort of our education system, for example, um, you know, you have really good schools and you got really bad schools and you have underfunded schools. And a lot of that, because we, 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 we fund our, our school systems locally, um, poor communities have disproportionately worse schools. You know, they have worse, they have worse buildings, worse books, worse technology. They can't pay their teachers very well. Um, and then you have, you know, upper income communities obviously have excellent schools. And so if you're a kid born into a, a, a poor community, you have a structural inequity that is a block for you to achieve success because you go through an education system that doesn't have as many opportunities for you as if you were born into a rich family. And so our education system has long been considered the, a, a place of mobility for people. Um, where anybody who works hard can um, end up in college and then make their own destiny. But if you're already behind the eight ball in terms of you're, you're funneled into a school system that uh, prevents you from succeeding, I, I would call that a structural inequity. And if you add on top of that, you know, views people have about race, and if that cultural racism plays out such that people view your lack of success in the inner city as a reflection on your capacity to work hard, Whereas in effect, it's actually a, a large part a consequence of the fact that you just haven't had the chance to learn well, then um, it feeds on itself in a couple different ways. And so I think those, those are the kinds of things that, you know, um, uh, speaking sort of as a citizen as opposed to a professor that, you know, um, we might want to sort of try to solve. Professor Franz, this has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, you're a very interesting guy to listen, listen to and talk with. Uh, and I'd like to have you back on this program uh, some more because I think people can uh, get a lot of insight and learn a lot uh, from a discussion with you. Uh, I think we're getting close to wrapping this up. I appreciate your uh, being here and talking to my audience, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, and it's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.